Hello, welcome back. Now, if I look the same as my other videos, this is not filmed on the same day. This is filmed on different days. I'm just wearing the same outfits. Actually, I don't know if that's even better. <laughs> Fine, it's filmed on the same day. Our story today starts with Molly Maggio, who was in New Jersey at the time where she got a new job at Radium Luminous Materials Corp. They made watches for the military. However, by 1922, she had felt really sick and she had to quit working at the factory. She just had this unbearable, I don't know if you guys ever had like unbearable toothaches before, but they really are horrible. The pain is like really close to your like face, to your head and toothache pain really does suck. But poor Molly, she would have this unbearable toothache and the dentist would just simply extract a tooth out. However, the pain would just move on to the next tooth, extract it, and then the next tooth. At some point, she had pus-filled ulcers in her mouth. Oh, I feel so bad for her. The pain, however, wasn't just localized to this one area. It had actually spread onto her limbs and ended up disabling her. She was in constant pain. By May of the same year, her mouth had turned into one large abscess. Any pressure that the dentist put on her jaw, it would just cause the bones to just break off. This made the dentist really confused. They had no idea what was going on with Molly. Why was she suffering so much? Uh, there was a quote here that I found. It took nothing more than just lifting her jawbone out of her mouth to remove it. This honestly sounds like something that's out of like a sci-fi horror movie. By September 12, same year, her jugular vein had hemorrhage. Now the jugular vein is like right around here. Um, it had caused her to choke and drown on her own blood. And this happened so quickly. The nurses who were there, they were unable to ease her pain, unfortunately. And, and she had passed by the age of 25. They would say that the cause of death was syphilis. But how could an STD cause such a violent, violent death? What was really causing this to happen? Our story is gonna shift over to Eben Byers, born on April 12, 1880. Eben was raised in a wealthy and affluent family in America. In his youth, he would win the National Amateur Golf Championship in 1906. Now, as he got older, he would inherit his dad's steel company. This was the largest steel company in America at the time. And at some point, he would become president. We're gonna fast forward in his life in his late 40s, early 50s. Uh, in 1927, he had injured his arm doing a Harvard-Yale football game. He had somehow tripped and injured his arm so badly that he was in so much pain. Being a rich man that he was, he had access to the best doctors, best medical care of that time. Now his doctor, Dr. Charles Clinton Moyer, had recommended this medication called Radithor to assist with the healing. This was before the FDA was strict as it is today, but the label is very vague. In the description it says, it will enhance the vital processes of the body. Honestly, it sounds like some of the LA shit that goes on today. I remember this one time when I moved to LA, this girl literally told me that my acne would be cured by drinking lots of water. Hmm. Anyways, the doctor prescribed Eben to have about one spoon, one small spoon a day. And upon taking it, Eben felt great. He would get like a burst of energy and he started realizing that his arm was healing. However, even though his arm had already been done healing, he continued to consume this medication because it was making him feel great. Again, at this point, he was almost like 50 years old. So this tonic essentially made him feel a lot younger. And who doesn't want access to the fountain of youth? So for the next two years, he would drink about two to three bottles of Radistor. It made him feel great. He exalted his medication. He fed it to his racehorses, gave it to his friends, family, girlfriends. He wanted to share the wealth with everybody else. But you know, perhaps all good things must come to an end because at some point he began to have pain in his jaw began to have toothaches, began to have these severe, severe headaches, and he began to lose weight. Again, being rich and having access to the best doctors, uh, he was finally able to see a Manhattan x-ray specialist by the name of Dr. Joseph Steiner. Now, Dr. Joseph Steiner, he has seen other young women with the same condition. He had recognized this as radium poisoning. But how could this have happened? Because radium, it was safe. All the rich people were doing it. Well, let's get into Radithor a little bit. Radithor mainly operated in New Jersey for about 10 years from 1918 to 1928. Uh, the owner, William Bailey, was a dropout from Harvard. 
was not a medical doctor, did not have a scientific or a medical degree. However, he did have membership in the American Association for the Advancement of Studies, but he was known to be a mountebank. He advertised the medication as perpetual sunshine or a cure for the living dead, more like speedrun to look like the living dead. And they would guarantee that Radithor is harmless in every aspect. Now, Radithor at the time was sold for one US dollar. Might not sound a lot now, but back then, this was a lot. Newspapers at this time were sold for about two cents. So Radithor being sold for one dollar is about 15 to $20 in today's amount. Only rich people had access to this. Poor people did not take this on a daily at all. Radithor was also seen as an energy drink. It was a cure-all panacea that doctors would tout. They believed that it cured arthritis, gout, neuritis, high blood pressure, anemia, leukemia, boils, blackhead, pimples, impotence even. Not gonna lie though, having moved to LA, I've definitely hear people say that about certain vitamins and uh, other other treatments as well. By 1930, Eben Byers had stopped consuming Radithor. His teeth had fell out. Two years after that, he surgically built his jaw. They were able to remove tissue from his face and help with the disconfiguration. But how did a millionaire like Eben and then Molly working a blue collar job in a factory, how did they share the same tragedies? Around 1917, factories were popping up everywhere, making watches for the military. Now these watches were special. These were glow in the dark watches. How did they make glow in the dark watches back in the day? Well, they used radium because radium glows in the dark. Molly had worked in the factory that had the radium paint, but, but how did she end up with her teeth falling out and her jaw falling out as well if she was possibly only inhaling it? I mean, I highly doubt she would be orally consuming the paint, right? When Molly began working in the factory, it was a time of excitement. These factories were mainly hiring women because they thought the women had daintier hands and they'd be able to paint the fine details on the watches. Working in the factory, there was radium dust everywhere and it made their clothes and their hair glowed. Molly had coworkers that would even wear their best dresses when going to work because after they got off work, they would leave work at night and they would have dresses that glue in the dark. There were some people that were skeptical about radium paint, however, but you know what? The managers were always like, no, you're good, you're fine. It's completely harmless. In fact, they instructed the women working in the factories to put the paintbrush into their mouth just to create a finer tip. They weren't allowed to use sponges or cloth or anything because they said putting in the mouth would be a lot faster. Some of the women even applied radium to their teeth just so they would get that radiant smile. So this explains how Molly had gotten radium exposure in her jaw. On April 11, 1932, Robert Wynn, who was the attorney for the Federal Trade Commission, he had interviewed Eben Byers. And this is the quote right here. Young in years and mentally alert, he could hardly speak. His head was swathed in bandages. He had undergone two successive operations in which his whole upper jaw, excepting the two front teeth and most of his lower jaw had been removed. All of the remaining bone tissue of his body was slowly disintegrating and holes were actually forming in his skull. At the time that the article was published on Times Magazine, two weeks prior, Eben Byers still had hopes that he would be cured. He didn't really think that the medicine that he'd been extolling for the past couple years would lead to his death. The autopsy would reveal that he had about 36 micrograms of radium in his body. Um, roughly 10 micrograms of radium is considered as fatal. The radium had been distributed throughout his bones. Both jaws were rotted. His brain had abscess. He actually even had a close friend named Mary Hill who had also died of radium poisoning as well. Now, the sickening part is Dr. Moyle was in complete denial. And this is a quote by the doctor. I never had a death among my patients for radium treatment. I've taken as much more or more radium water as the same kind Mr. Byers took. And I am 51 years old active and healthy. I believe that radium water has a definite place in treatment of certain diseases and I prescribe them when I deem it necessary. He knew, he declared, that Byers had died from a combination of blood diseases which had induced gout. This dude was in denial. I wonder what ended up happening to this doctor. Like, do you continue taking it? And he also died of radium poisoning as well. Now at this point, Eben had passed away 10 years after Molly had Radium poisoning was not known at the time of Molly's passing, which is why they had labeled it as syphilis. Although I don't know how they connect syphilis to your jaw falling out. Later on, they would finally acknowledge Molly's death and attribute it to radium poisoning 
from her work at the factory. Now, other factory workers as well turned up with similar ailments and they would end up trying to sue the factories. So what ended up happening to the Radithor company? Well, a couple months before even Byer's death, Bailey, the owner of Radithor, was sent a cease and desist for the promulgation of Radithor as a harmless medical product with therapeutic effects. He did not contest the charges after he heard the testimony of Eben Byers. However, even though he didn't contest this, this man did not learn their lesson because they tried to sell Radithor again, but under a new moniker. And you would think that despite the deaths and despite the publicity of Radithor, that people would stop taking it. No, they did not. There were obstinate self-medicators at the time, like the New York mayor, who continued to drink radium with water. He was quoted in the Times Magazine saying, I won't stop using it. Now, I did look up this New York mayor to see what happened to him and if he ended up dying young or if his jaw fell off as well. Um, but he did end up passing away of a brain hemorrhage at the age of 65. So I wonder at some point he just stopped taking because he was like, oh, this is not good. If you're like me, you probably thought the same thing that the scientific community at the time didn't know how harmful radium was. However, when radium was discovered in 1898 by Marie and Pierre Curie, they did not even condone the consumption of radium. As a matter of fact, in 1913, there was an article that claimed radium goes into your bone. And then shortly afterwards, in 1914, there was an article review of 700, 700 medical reports that show the consumption led to bone necrosis and ulcerations. However, for some reason, the company Radithor, they knew that the high doses killed people, but they're like, eh, when distilled in water, it had benefits. Radithor sales continue on in the 1920s. It's unfortunate for Eben that he thought he had access to the best care in the world, but he had access to a doctor who believed in quack medicine. It's also unfortunate for Molly as well, who started off her young life working in a factory, earning money for her, her family, her siblings, and to pass away at such a young age. 1965, Eben Byer's body had been exhumed. Now, at the time of his death, his body was so radioactive that they had to put his body in a lead-lined coffin. This was to help block the radiation. It says here that radium has a half-life of 1,600 years. And if you didn't pay attention to your science classes, what is half-life? Half-life is like the time it takes for the radioactivity to reduce to half of its potency. Meaning, when they had exhumed Eben Byer's body, it was still as radioactive as the day that he was buried. Eben Byer's body was returned in his lead coffin. Have you all heard of Radithor before? Because I haven't heard of it until, uh, it was like a couple months ago. But there was no major public health crisis about this because during that time, again, only the wealthy had access to it. The poor people didn't really have access to it. It wasn't like the normal public was going through with these bone necrosis that led to their jaws, you know, falling off. I randomly did come across a website that does sell the bottle in case you want to have it or give it to your favorite person in the world. But anyways, thank you so much for watching and don't forget to hit the like button. If you enjoyed the video, feel free to subscribe and say hi, stop by my live streams and I'll see you guys later. I mainly stream on Twitch. <laughs>